Well, as was said, welcome to week three of this uh, unfinished series that we're in. And I hope that this verse that we're telling you about will be one that you'll memorize, which is Philippians 1, 6, because it's a promise of God and God is a promise keeper. And so here's the verse once again. I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will, God will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So what that tells us is when it comes to our faith, there's no such thing as a graduation ceremony on this side of eternity. That there is a continually a next step for us to, to grow in, that we're still not done. And there's a next step for us as a church. In fact, two weeks ago, we showed a 10 minute video in service talking to you about where we believe God has you individually, but where God is leading us as a church. And if you didn't get that, it's on our new unfinished page, which is unfinished.vrl.church. And you can take a look at that again. And there's other resources that'll help you as we go on this journey together. In addition, we've handed out these things called guidebooks. And I'm going to ask the ushers to go ahead and come on forward right now. If you've not yet received a guidebook, go ahead and raise your hands because we want to make sure that every single person in our church has one of these things. So they're coming down. You've got to keep them up high so they can see and they will throw it down the aisle. Just think popcorn, peanuts, whatever you need. You know, they're going to throw these things down because this guidebook is more than just for sermon notes. And I want you to bring it back each week. And if you forgot, then there's the QR code that'll be on the screen as well that you can kind of grab that again. But it's to help you also in your connection at home. So I don't know if you ever thought about this, but there's questions in there that you're going to do in your life group, but these questions could also be done at the kitchen table. It could be done in conversation. Uh, and there's other information that's going to help you kind of be, us be united together as we go on this journey together. Uh, in addition to that, I want to remind you that our primary goal is 100% engagement. Now, we can get excited, but we want to be engaged with what God is doing. And, and the second part is that we are trying to raise $17 million as a generosity initiative over the next two years to fulfill what we believe God is calling us to step into. Is it risky? Yes. Does it take trust? Absolutely. But we have an unfinished, we're not done yet, an unfinished mission, an unfinished vision, and an unfinished outreach. Our mission, to continue to be and make disciples for Jesus. Our unfinished vision, we're growing, and we want to continue to make room for who God is calling to bring. And so that's some of the expansion stuff that we've talked about. Well, as we reach the world for Jesus one person at a time, and our unfinished outreach, we want to make sure we're making a difference outside these walls, in our community, as around the world, and all of that's in the booklets as well. Last thing I want to remind you of is what's called our Advanced Commitment Night. This is Monday night, November 4th. Now, this is for anybody who's ready to say, I'm in. Who's ready to say, you know, bring my commitment card and very will say, you know, I'm joining with what God is doing in my life through what God is doing through Valley Real Life. And we want to invite you to that night as we have a moment. There's, there's these special moments in church's histories. And this is going to be one of those moments where we just declare, God, we are doing this for you. We are, we are individually and as a church dedicating this time and the season for you. There'll be another opportunity to commit a few weeks later in case you can't commit that night. But I chose that night on purpose. Monday, November 4th. It's 24 hours before the election, and I want to gather our people together, and we're going to pray for our country, but we're going to be reminded that whether our party or candidate wins, that the king who is on the throne will still be the king on November 6th, as well as November 4th and November 5th, and his name is Jesus. And so we want to make sure we're here. We have a mission. We have an opportunity to continue to engage with this individually and together. And so we're going to do that on November 4th. With that being said, let me pray for our time together. Lord, I know that everybody is walking in with different things in their hearts and minds. Whether things of greatness or things of pain and struggle, I just pray that you would be with us here. That you would speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, allow us to be fully present. Father, we're in this room and we say, speak, Lord, we are listening. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are looking at the life of Abram, who is also Abraham, who at 75 years of age was called by God to leave everything that he knew and to go where God was leading him. And that takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of trust. In fact, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, it says this in the New Testament, looking back on Abraham's life. It says, it was by faith, which is another word for trust, that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave his home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. Can you imagine the real life conversation that Abraham has with Sarah after talking with God? Can you imagine that? Uh, hey, honey. Uh, yes, dear. 
uh, I, I just had a conversation with God. Oh, really, dear? What did uh, he say? He says, uh, we get to go on a trip. Oh, really, we get to go to Hawaii? Uh, no, no, not exactly. Well, where are we going? Well, um, we get to wander around, you know, in tents, you know, for quite a long time. And then he's going to reveal to us where it is that we're going after we've been in tents for several weeks, months, or years. And no, honey, I promise I've not been drinking again. You know, you could just imagine this real life conversation because Sarah's not in the room when Abraham's having this conversation with God. And to say, this is what God's called us together. So I wonder who had the greater faith, by the way. Was it Abraham or was it Sarah, you know, who's listening to her husband and saying, I guess we're going to do that which doesn't make a lot of sense, which is today we're looking at this concept called trust. Now, if you've ever participated in something called a trust fall, you know what you would do? You gather a group of people that are behind you, you kind of stand up on something higher and you kind of fall back. Well, as you've seen online, trust falls become trust fails fairly quickly, whether on purpose or by accident. You know, people hit the ground or hit their heads. And, and yet, what a great example of what we really go through in life. A lot of us have trust issues. And the reason we have trust issues is because we've been through situations or people that we thought were trustworthy who let us down. It could have been something going back to our childhood where mom or dad were supposed to be there and they weren't. It could have been a friend. It could have been a spouse. It could have been a child. I don't know what it is, but most of us have experiences in life where it's not all roses. It's not all good. And somebody hurts us, lets us down, which causes us to be a little less trusting the next go around. We call it wisdom, but in reality, it's because we're afraid of being hurt again. And unfortunately, what we tend to do then is personify that with God. We're like, God, I'm not sure I can trust you if I can't see, if I can't experience, if I can't know for certain that I can trust you in this situation. See, the big idea today is God can do the impossible, but it requires us to step into the impractical. It's called faith. It's called trust. Abraham had to decide, yeah, I'm going to go but it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to go. And so you and I are gonna have to also say, you know what, we're gonna choose to follow you. And the times that we know we're actually choosing to trust God is actually not when things make sense or things are going well, but it's actually times of difficulty or times of testing. That's when we actually find out, because you and I can say we trust God. We can sing, we can raise our hands about how we trust God, but you only really know if you trust God when God is all you have. To put your trust into. When you, when you can't see how it all is going to make sense, will you then say, yes, I choose to trust you? And it's interesting that God allows us to go through times of testing in order to grow us in trusting in him. It's kind of like Jesus when he sat down, he gathers his people and he was going to preach to them. And John 6, 5, it says this, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd. There were people who were coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? It's fascinating that very next sentence, though, says what? He was testing Philip. And what's Philip's response? Philip's response to this was, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. See, it doesn't make sense to his illogical mind. How in the world are we going to feed 5,000 people when we have nothing to feed them with? It would take us months. He doesn't realize who he's talking to. And so it was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, who says, hey, hey Jesus, not sure it's going to help. I got five loaves of bread and two fish. But how will that go amongst so many? And Jesus says, well, I'll just have them sit down. So they sit down. He prays, breaks the bread, and he hands it out. And they didn't just take a bite. They ate till they were full, and there were 12 basketfuls left over. He was teaching his disciples, understand who you're talking to. Understand who you're trusting. Understand that you can trust me even when things don't make a lot of sense. Now, Ronald, our uh, partner in Uganda, uh, Ronald's been on the mission field. I mean, this is his home base, and him and his wife, Musina, they've done incredible work for the Lord, but they've gone through real things that you and I don't go through, like how about not eating for several days? And so they had a time in their ministry where they were ministering to the Lord, and they couldn't understand why God was not providing what he said he would provide. So are they going to continue to trust him? And so in their faith in God, they sat down one evening at a table with no food and they said, God, we trust you that you are going to provide. We don't know how, we don't know when, we don't know where, but we are going to choose to trust you anyway. Unbeknownst to them, the area witch doctor hated Ronald. I mean, they knew he hated him, but they didn't know what he was doing. So this witch doctor conjures up this curse 
this spell, this, this situation, and he throws this on this chicken. And he puts the chicken in front of Ronald's house to curse the house and to curse Ronald. He knocks on the door and he runs away. Ronald opens the door, looks down and sees this chicken, and he looks up and he says, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and he cooks the chicken and he eats the chicken. And that they're full, the witch doctor was waiting for him to die because the curse was upon that chicken. But, the, but they didn't die. And it wasn't too much later that the witch doctor came to faith and is currently in Ronald's church today. That's amazing. And it's a true story from Ronald. And you can meet the witch doctor if you go to Uganda. It's nuts. It's absolutely crazy. Well, he's not called a witch doctor anymore. That helps. <laughs> But what's interesting about that, think about it for just a second. How often did Ronald say, God, where are you? I I'm hungry. Why aren't you providing food? Why aren't you providing food? Because God's saying, I have something bigger in mind. You can't see it right now. Uh, you need to trust me in the testing right now because I'm gonna provide through this witch doctor because he needs to come to know me and he's gonna use this situation. And so even though you're without food, can you trust me? Can you trust me? That's hard to do. It's actually really, really, really hard to do. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if I told you that Abraham was a man of trust? That's what the Bible says, right? And we think when we read in Hebrews that, oh my gosh, because of his faith, and we take Bible characters and we like almost elevate them as heroes. And the only thing that made them heroes was that they trusted God. They're ordinary people like you and I. In fact, let me just prove it to you that in five instances, in our Bibles alone, we find out five times that Abraham failed in trusting God. And it didn't take much for him not to trust God. He just left, and here's the first one. Genesis chapter 12, as he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abraham said to his wife, Sarah, look, you are a very beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is my wife, let's kill him. Then we can have her, so please tell them you are my sister. Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. Wow. Good job, Abram. Way to trust the Lord that he was going to lead you. He was going to protect that he was going to provide. Nope, this is their first challenge, and he fails in trusting God. What's ironic about it is that not too many chapters later, he does the same thing. Different times, same thing. He says, please tell him you're my sister. Didn't we learn the first time? And then when I read that and I think, Abram, what's wrong with you? I think, thank God there's people like Abram because you're like me. Because how many times have I said, I'm gonna trust you, God, and then I don't trust God in that situation, and then the very same situation comes up not too long later, and I choose not to trust him again. Where is God in that? How does he view that? Hold on to that for a second. How about this time? Genesis 16, 2. Uh, so Sarah said to Abram, hey, you know the Lord has told us this promise, but he's prevented me from having children. So let's solve the problem for God. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. Wow. Second option. Now, in this day, it wasn't very, as was uncommon. If you couldn't have kids, you would have surrogates, and this would be the way to pass the family line. But that's not what God told them. They never sought God that this was the right way. So we agreed. Well, problem was, is because of that lack of faith, that lack of trust, he sleeps with this maidservant named Hagar. She has a son. They name him Ishmael. Later on, Jacob, I mean, later on, they have that Abraham and Sarah have a son named Jacob. Jacob and Ishmael decide to fight for all eternity. It's called the Arabs and the Jews. This is their lineage, this is their history. They trace it back to Father Abraham. There are consequences in our lives when we choose not to trust God. This was kind of a big one. How about this one? Failure to trust God number four. And then Sarah said to Abraham, uh, this is all your fault. And this is my favorite marriage moment. <laughs> this is as real as it gets, right? After all of this stuff, her idea, then she comes to him and says, this is your fault. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, Abram, you or me. It's like, awesome. Abram replied, look, she's your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. This ain't my problem, this is your problem. I was like, this is a real conversation. If anybody's been married for more than two seconds, you're like, yep, been there, done that. Well, maybe not that, I hope, you know, but there's other situations. <laughs> Then Sarah treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. And God says, no, no, this isn't right. I'm going to meet her there. This is not what God wanted him to do. And failure number four. How about five? 24 years later, since the promise has been made, how long would you trust God? If he gave you a promise and said something was going to happen in your life, how long before you say, I don't know if I can trust it's going to happen? 25 years later is when they finally have a child. 
I don't know about you, but I, I, get, I struggle about 25 minutes into the process. And I'm like, God, why aren't you moving on this? Why aren't you going faster? Why aren't you solving this? I guess I gotta do it myself. So after 24 years, Abraham is now 99 years old and God reminds him, hey, it's gonna happen again. It's gonna happen, I promise you, within the next year. Genesis 17, 17, then Abraham bowed down to the ground and he laughed to himself in disbelief. Talk about a lack of trust. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought, and how can Sarah have a baby when she's 90 years old? Doesn't make practical sense. I don't know about you, how you're feeling about your unfinished faith journey, but I'm feeling pretty good now after looking at Abraham's because this is us. And I want to teach you something here because I think it's something that we really need to understand when it comes to trust is that failure can often be our greatest teacher in learning to trust God. But that's not usually how we respond. When we fail, when we don't trust God, we tend to hide in shame. We tend to distance ourselves from God and from other people. And God is saying, no, no, let's use this as a learning opportunity, an opportunity to grow in our trust of him. Let me tell you one area that I think most of us have had or are or will be challenged, unlike what happens in Uganda, unlike what what takes place at Abraham's time, where we tend to have a challenge amongst Christians today is with our finances. It's fascinating. I know we don't carry cash anymore, but you remember what's on the bills, right? It says these words, in God we trust. The question is, really? Do you, do I really trust God when it comes to his provision. Because I think this idea of unfinished is a test for each of us that we can learn, that we can grow from. Many people don't give in a way that God has called them to give because, honestly, we lack trust in God's provision. Uh, We live in a safe and highly calculated way. So to not make it sense at the bottom line says, I can't do that because I can't see it. But isn't that the whole point? It's not a finance issue, it's a faith issue, it's a trust issue. In fact, did you know that today Christians give an average of two to three percent of their income anywhere? Two to three percent. Here's what's also interesting as your income grows, your percentage gets less, typically. Whatever you give, even though your dollar amount of giving to whatever God has called you to give may grow in number, your percentage actually gets smaller. So, are we really trusting in Him? Because oftentimes, it really is a faith step for us. Now, most of us at times, I know I have done this, we justify it like, well, God, you've not led my heart in order to give. And the reality is, is that yes, the issue is in our hearts, but it's a lack of trust in him. That's what it comes down to. See, God's gonna call some of us to give in sacrifices in ways that are not gonna make sense. But when he does, it gives him the opportunity to show you and I, good job, watch me work. Now, here's a crazy question that I want to share with you that was shared with me a number of years ago, and and I just like, I don't even know how to answer this, but maybe you will. If you were God, would you give you more money? What a great question. Some of you will be like, yes, of course I would. Sometimes it's easy to say, well, if I just had more money, then I'd be more generous. I wonder how many times God's saying, why would I give you more resources when you don't honor and trust me with the resources I've given you right now? We learn to trust God through times of testing when it doesn't make sense. In fact, let me give you two examples uh, from the Blackmans. They're gonna give us a little testimony here of finances, but they're also gonna give a perspective about our church. How do we trust where God is leading? How do we trust what he's doing? So go ahead and check out the screens with me now. As I've learned to tithe and trust God with my finances, it's gone from an obligation to a desire to do that. The indoor playground thing, I could not vision it at all. But then they did it, and now I I help with the playground. And I meet a lot of people there, some people looking for a church to go to. What a better way to tell them, well, this is the church you would go to. You can show them the classrooms. You can show them the check-in desk. I mean, you can really make them feel like it's not walking into a whole new experience that might be too scary. They like their kids to play there. It's really a fun place for the kids. So then they bring their friends. Sometimes we have the mops group shows up with all the kids. Uh, so it's, it's just been a real good way for outreach. My trust has grown over time. Something as simple as a playground, right? That clearly the two of us could not see the vision for it and could not see the eventual benefit of what that would have been. And realizing, well, oh, someone else saw it better than we did and you know, God was at work. When I see unfinished doing 
basically the same thing, where we're going to be building a bigger uh, facility so that more people can come, uh, more opportunity for baptisms and a lot of growth. Just look at the 930 and 11 service. Everybody's had to move right. A greater capacity is, is definitely needed. Like there's houses popping up in places. I'm like, well, that used to be a hill. But you know, but there's people, right? And there's people that do need a church and there's people that do need to hear the word of God. And, there's the, and that's where we need to come in as the body. And if that means creating another small group somewhere because there's not enough room now, so be it. If that's building an auditorium, so be it. We really are gonna trust him to lead us in the right direction. The path that the church is taking is good and solid, and if we can continue to grow, but without losing that that element, mm -hmm. I think the legacy is already already built and sustained. I think as people, we're always unfinished until we go to heaven. Can we thank the Blackburns, Davis, for sharing that? <laughs> It's not easy to trust God. I didn't mention the last service. Uh, this last week was really, really hard for me to entrust God with some things that he is doing and leading and conflict and some of those things you know, in my own life. And it's not by mistake that God would make me teach a lesson on trust. That uh, I would have to go through this and then hear myself talk for four services you know, to try to instill it in me. And I hope that this can be an encouragement with you as well, because I think all of us have areas that we have a hard time entrusting ourselves to God with where we're at and where we're going, individually, but also as a church. Now, some people have been confused about this uh, connection card, or I mean, this commitment card. And, and people look at this, and the first response as they walk through this, they say, oh, this is a finance card. It could be further from the truth. It's actually a faith and trust card. Uh, this is the discipleship tool. Let me, let me show you what I mean by that. In the, in the first line, it talks about looking back so that you can see the faithfulness of God. Now you look back and say, what do I or we normally give in a year? And sometimes you need to look back to say, ah, I can trust God, because oh my gosh, we gave to God and he showed up time and time and time again. And that can build the trust that we can have in him. Now for some of you, you've never given before, and what an opportunity to be able to say, huh, this is gonna be my first step into entrusting what God has given to me. In fact, uh, when I was a, um, uh, a kid, one of the things that, that was instilled in me as a sixth grader that I never forgot was this statement. Do I trust that God can do more with 90% than I can do with 100%? And, and, and don't get caught up in the numbers. The whole point was, uh, do I believe that God can do more as I entrust myself to him? And that stuck with me for a long time. And so for some of you, I hope this is a trust experience, a trust exercise, and that you see how he comes through. Now, the next line, you know, in this commitment card is the next step in trust, uh, because it's very easy for those of us who do give on a regular basis for automation to become autopilot. So when's the last time that you sat down with God and said, God, is there an opportunity for me to expand, to grow, and to trust you even maybe in a way that doesn't make sense? Because that's what I did when I first started trusting him with the resources, in fact, we have a guy in our church who, who felt like he and his family were called to give towards something. And so he, he's processing through and he tells his wife this number and she's like, what in the world? How in the world are we gonna do that? And he's like, I don't know. He then decides to put a video together and sends it to his guys group. And as I'm sitting here talking to him, I'm just like, what compelled you to do this? He goes, God gave me a number that he said, I want to be obedient to him. He goes, here's the crazy part, Dan. He goes, in my industry... This is not a hard number to make or to hit when times are good, but times are not good, so we're going to really have to trust that he's going to have to provide. And I was like, what a great example of us growing in trust with him. This last part, though, I'm probably most excited about when it comes to our faith journey. It says gifts from our, or our stored resources. See, all of us have stored resources. This is anything that God has entrusted to us. This could be a home, a car. This could be, you know, uh, uh, your savings accounts. It could be, you know, your hobbies. It could be anything God has entrusted to you. Here is the discipleship moment that's gonna change everything for some of you, and that's this. I want you to write down your top 10 most valuable earthly treasures that God has given you, and I want you to ask God one question. Just you and him. Write it down and ask him this one question. God, am I honoring you with this resource? and go one by one. 
And since I've already heard it from other people, this is what's going to happen. He's going to affirm you in a lot of things. And you, people take things like a house. Am I honoring you with this house? And they're like, yes, I'm honoring because I'm open-handed with it or whatever it may be. And you'll go through it. But inevitably, there will be some things on there that you have not honored God with. And it's not because your heart was bad. You just haven't even thought about it. What an opportunity to do one of two things, because here's the truth. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. I want to make sure I remind you of something. You and I own nothing. We own nothing. As followers of Christ, it all belongs to him. He's entrusted us with everything, including our kids, which can I just be honest and just say, thank God they're not my kids sometimes. Like, God, this is your problem. You got to deal with this one. You know, teenage years, it's hard, you know? So just, just understand, everything belongs to God, people and all his possessions. So as you go through this, you're going to get hit with some of these things. You're huh, well, what do I do now? Well, as a follower of Christ, you only have one of two options in your trust of God, which is you start aligning it to kingdom purposes. You start being more open-handed. You start saying, yes, God, this is yours. How can I honor you with this resource? That's an incredible journey. Or you sell it and give it to kingdom impact. Which here's the truth. All of us have to stand before God one day, individually before God. He's going to ask, what did you do with what I gave you? It's called the parable of the talents. And I just tell you is that as, as your pastor, this isn't meant to scare you, to guilt you, or to make you feel bad. What it's meant to do is align your hearts to the things that God has entrusted to you. This is a faith card. It's not a finance card. And it allows us commonly to go through something that many of us struggle with when it comes to resources. I hope that makes sense. Now, with that being said, I am giddy about this last point. So if you haven't listened, please listen to this because this wraps up these first two examples of our finances, but Abraham's journey. Our confidence to trust God simply comes from comprehending the commitment of God. That if you understand God's commitment to you, it makes it a lot easier to entrust ourselves to him. He goes first. So, so check this out. Genesis chapter 15. Notice the conversation that Abraham has with God. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, oh, sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Can you hear the doubts? He says, since you've given me no children, Eliza of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You've given me no descendants of my own, so none of my, one of my servants is gonna be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, no, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteous because of his faith. Don't miss that. So he says, all right, God, you've now proven trustworthy. I am going to trust you with having an heir. Then the story doesn't end there. He says this. Then the Lord told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. But Abram replied, oh, sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I'll actually possess it? So he says, I'm going to trust you with my heir now, but now you told me you're going to give me land. How do I know? How, how do I know I can trust you? How do I know I can be sure? Do you know that when all of us have doubts, all of our doubts are primarily rooted in two primary questions. When you have a doubt, when I have a doubt in life, they're rooted in one of these two questions or both or a mixture of, how can I trust God? When we have doubt, we're wondering, can I trust God in this or in that, which we'll get to in a second. But the second question is just as profound in the, as the first, which is, how can I trust me? We've let God down. We've made mistakes. How is God supposed to trust me? How do I trust me? Because I've made mistakes in relationships or with finances or whatever it may be. And here is God in Genesis chapter 15. He gives Abraham the answer and it's powerful and life-changing if you'll connect with me on this. So to summarize, let me tell you, verses nine and 10. God says, Abram, great question. Bring me five animals, a goat, a cow, a ram, a dove, and a pigeon. I want you to cut these animals in half, find a ditch, put half of their bodies on one side, half on the other, so their blood flows down into the ditch, which makes a river of blood. What in the world? What's going on here is in your and my day, when we need to know that an agreement has taken place, we want it in what? Writing. 
We want something written down. The higher the agreement, the more eyes we want on the writing, including lawyers involved, to make sure that everything is done so it's ironclad. In this day, the higher the agreement, blood covenants would be made. And this is one of the examples, and this is a blood oath. The Hebrew word for covenant, which is what this word, which is taking place here, literally means to cut. And so they would, we, you and I would say, we are signing a contract. They would say, we are cutting a covenant. So Abram and God are supposed to make this blood covenant to help show Abram he can trust God. It's going to be written in blood. Notice what happens. As the sun was going down, Abram fell into a deep sleep. After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day. Abram was sleeping. So who passes between the bloody animals? God. With a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch. Who didn't pass through the bloody animals? Abram. In fact, in those days, when a king made a blood covenant with a servant, the king would never have to walk through because the king's word would always be trusted, so they said. It would always have to be the servant. This is the only covenant recorded in history where God goes through and the servant does not. Now, don't miss this. This is life-changing. If God fails to keep up his side of the bargain, what he's saying is he will pay with his blood. But if Abram fails to keep up his side of the bargain, God is saying, I also will pay with my blood. God takes responsibility for both sides of the covenant, which should compel us to say, I can trust you. So don't miss this. This is one of the most clearest pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament. This is the cross. Just like when Abram fell into a deep sleep, we are deep, dreadful sleep in sin. The gospel tells us that when Jesus died, a dreadful darkness descended upon the whole earth, and Jesus' blood flowed out of his side like a river. Was Jesus dying because he hadn't kept up his end of the bargain? No. Was Jesus dying because we hadn't kept up ours? Yes. The covenant is you and I don't have to pay for failing to meet the requirements of the covenant because Jesus pays for both sides, which is why you can clap about that. This is why communion is so important. This is why this connection, this covenant that we have was so important because you and I are going to fail. But in our failure, the covenant is not broken because Jesus paid for both sides. And we can continue to run back to God. We can continue to come back to God, which is why Jesus says he took the cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, for the sins of many. God can be trusted. And when we fail... He will pick us back up again, which is why Proverbs 24 says, for though the righteous fall seven times, they will rise again. You make a failure, he picks you up. You make another failure, he picks you up. You don't trust God, he's gonna pick you up. Our part is to allow God to pick us back up. That shows that we are entrusting ourselves to God again. That's why no matter what you do, he still sees you as righteous because what Jesus has done. He's fulfilled both sides of the covenant. Unfinished is our moment to step out in faith, showing we trust in God's faithfulness. So the question becomes, will you trust God to the impossible when he asks you to do the impractical? My favorite verse, my life verse, comes from the Old Testament, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. We lose that trust when we start depending on our own understanding. We start taking our own control. But he says, seek his will in all that you and I do, and he will show you which path to take. So let me bring this home. Maybe you're single right now, and you have a desire to be married. Would you trust God in this season? Will you trust God in your relationships? Uh, Maybe you're struggling with an addiction or trying to find the courage to tell someone that you're struggling. Would you trust God by sharing with others? Maybe you're super successful in your job, but you know it's become your primary identity. 
Would you trust God to be your identity? Maybe you're a person who likes to control every part of your life. Nobody's going to tell you what to do with your time, talents, and treasures. Will you trust God in this area? Maybe you're in high school and you're worried about your future. Will you trust God with your future? Maybe you're going through some health challenges and pains. Can you trust God in your health? Maybe you're an empty nester and you're trying to find a better way to add value to your life now that the kids are out of the house. Can you trust God with your value? Maybe you're having a hard time trusting God with your finances. Will you be generous to the Lord who has shown you kindness? Will you trust God with your resources? We are unfinished people with an unfinished story. So we will declare today with more than words, God, we trust you. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out and we're going to do something different. And that is in this last song, I'm going to ask you to remain seated because I know that all of us have an area that we have a hard time trusting or entrusting ourselves to God. And you know what that area is. What a great opportunity to be reminded of the promises of God that he can be trusted based on what he has done, is doing, and will do And for you to declare, as you talk to him, I'm gonna choose to trust you again, because here's the cool part. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness, even when we are unfaithful. That's how much God loves. If you failed, God says, yep, I'm right here. Let me pick you back up. Let's try again. And so we're gonna allow this song, and this song's gonna speak to the things we've talked about today, and it's gonna be unfamiliar. You're more than welcome to begin to sing, but really just sit in this posture and just have a moment with God. There's a lot of places we need to go, a lot of places we need to be, but like God wants us here right now. And if God has called you to accept Christ, I am gonna ask you to head to the cross. Called you to be baptized, go to the cross as well. But let me pray as we go into this holy moment, this time that we get to entrust ourselves to him. Jesus, thank you for being trustworthy. And I pray that you would bring to heart and to mind anything that we're having a hard time entrusting ourselves to you. Help us to speak to you, to listen to you, and to bring it before you now. It's in Jesus' name we pray.